Quantum entanglement is a bizarre and fascinating concept, but also extremely counterintuitive. These entangled particles, quantum entanglement, entanglement, entangled. These can be in what's called a, an entangled state. Entanglement is a perfect correlation, a connection between two particles that ensures that these two always have the exact opposite property when measured, no matter how far apart they are. Entanglement allows us to do some really cool things, like quantum teleportation or quantum cryptography. But one frequent question people have about it is, where is it from and how do you get it in the first place? The answer is that you can create entanglement in a lab. And in this video, we will look into exactly how that works. And also what it has to do with these rings of light. Because by understanding how it is created, we also gain a better understanding of what it really is. One of the most straightforward examples of how to create entanglement is this. You start with a single particle at rest, with no spin. Spin. Spin is a built-in property that particles simply have, like mass or charge, but in a direction. In a very basic sense, charge tells you how a particle will react to an electric field, while the spin direction tells you how a particle will react to a magnetic field. We could specify what particle we're talking about, but that is not really necessary for our example. The important part is that this particle can decay into two photons, two particles of light. The total spin must be conserved by this process, so as we start with spin zero, it must remain zero after the decay. This only works if one photon has spin plus one and the other one has spin minus one. But it is completely random which photon ends up with which spin exactly. We can write down the spin of each photon like this. This is just a description commonly used in quantum mechanics. What any normal person would expect is that one photon with spin plus one and one photon with spin minus one would be randomly created, but this is not quite what happens. Rather, a superposition, a combination of both possibilities is created, like this. This description tells us that whatever photon we measure, the other one must have the opposite spin. We, we cannot predict what the measurement outcome will be, but once we get a result, we immediately know that the other photon has the opposite spin. This is the meaning of entanglement. So in this case, the entanglement is just a consequence of a conservation law, the conservation of spin. And that's actually a very common mechanism how entanglement is created. So like I said, this is a very straightforward way to do it, at least conceptually, um, not so much practically. A much more practical way to create entanglement is parametric down conversion. But to talk about that, we first have to talk about optical crystals. Everyone knows how glass interacts with light, but different crystals can have unusual optical properties depending on their molecular structure. And we will need two of those properties, nonlinearity and birefringence. Birefringence means that a crystal has two different refractive indices for the two different polarizations of light. In simplified terms, polarization is the direction in which a light wave is oscillating. You can have vertical or horizontal direction and any other direction is just a combination of those two. Therefore, when a light ray containing both polarization directions enters a birefringent crystal, the two different components are refracted differently. In simpler terms, the beam splits up into two separate beams, one with horizontal polarization and one with vertical. And nonlinear means that the frequency, the color of the incoming light can be changed within the crystal. So you can get a different color out than the color you put in. This could be used for a lot of different things, but as I said, what we're interested in is down conversion. The incident photon is annihilated and two new photons of lower frequency are created. All the conservation laws apply, so the total energy must be conserved, meaning the energies of the two new photons must add up to the initial energy of the incident photon. This means the frequencies must also add up to the initial frequency. Also, momentum conservation means that the direction of the new beams must have the same angle to the initial direction. And as this can happen in any spatial direction, the downconverted light will be emitted in a cone shape. If several different photons can be created, you get different cones for different frequencies. Now, 
if the crystal is both non-linear and birefringent, like barium borate for example, you split up the incident beam into two beams of different polarization because of birefringence and each one creates a light cone because of non-linearity. So we get two light cones and every single down conversion process creates one horizontal photon on one cone and one vertical photon on the other cone. And these must always match perfectly because they are always created together. You can fix the directions of the cones by the properties of the crystal, by the angle of the laser light, etc. And when we get the two cones to intersect, we create a very interesting situation. The two photons from the intersecting points must be correlated. One must be horizontal and the other vertical. But as they lie on the intersections of both cones, they could be either, as long as they are always the opposite. When we write down this state, this is either photon A, vertical, and photon B, horizontal, or the other way around. And both are equally likely. This is, again, an entangled state. You can also have situations where you have several cones intersecting, and in this case, you get several entangled photon states. These two are entangled, these two are entangled, and these two are entangled. I have referred to this process as down conversion so far, but its full name is spontaneous parametric down conversion. It's called spontaneous because the process is triggered by a random field fluctuation in the light field. And parametric means energy is not lost to the crystal, but is conserved by the photons alone. And while this example was way more complicated than the first one, in concept it's pretty much the same. Create two quantum objects that must have opposite properties due to some conservation laws and create uncertainty which object has which property exactly. This is, in a nutshell, how you create entanglement. Parametric down conversion is a very significant process in practice, but it's not the only one out there. There are some other optical processes for creating entangled photons, but you can also entangle particles like electrons or atoms. You can even transfer entanglement from photons to atoms or the other way around. This is very useful for quantum computers, for example, so you can have stationary qubits for computations and you can use photons to transfer states to other qubits somewhere else. One process that isn't really relevant anymore, but it used to be relevant for historical reasons, is atomic cascades. It uses an effect from atomic physics to create entangled photons. And it was used in the first experiments to test the Bell inequality. I will shortly publish a short on this. Really? Okay, you heard it. I have done a good number of videos on entanglement, so if you're interested in this topic, you can check some of those out. This video is a deep dive into what entanglement means and how it works. Also, I've started a series covering all the historical milestones of entanglement, starting with Einstein's first formulation of the idea. Then, covering John Bell's magnificent contribution, the Bell inequality, which showed that you can measure the nature of reality using entanglement. And also a video on the first experiment testing this by 2022 Nobel laureate John Clauser. This series will continue next year when I will look at the Bell test experiments by Alain Aspé and also the nature of triple entanglements, the GHC states. I'm Chris and this is Physics But Awesome. At the moment I'm mostly doing stuff on quantum mechanics, quantum computing and cosmology, so if you like this video, subscribe for more.